it probably the World Cup it seems a distant memory you now in New Zealand obviously the champions and were they champions your reflections on the World Cup how successful was it some people said it was the best ever would you agree I would yeah I thought it was uh, a great tournament helped by a number of factors the weather was was very good it led to more entertaining games I thought the emergence of the second tier nations was uh, a real highlight as well the likes of Japan beating uh, South Africa so early in the tournament you know uh, probably had a lot of the casual fans tuning in as a result of that and you could see the Georgians, uh, the Canadas, those second tier nations were always very competitive in the match. Uh, the stronger nations seemed to pull away but it wasn't until the last sort of 15 minutes uh, before they, they managed that. So from that point of view it's opened up rugby to new audiences as well which is fantastic but yeah uh, New Zealand worthy champions absolutely. Uh, Unfortunately uh, for Ireland, I think they were just hit by too many injuries, uh, mm -hmm. too many injuries in crucial positions as well, and uh, and uh, they just weren't able to, to get across that that uh, that strong Argentinian side. I suppose fair to say, but too, the second half against France, you know, uh, pleased to see Ireland play many times. It was mm -hmm. one of the bravest performances I think ever by an Irish side. It was, yeah. I mean, I, everybody would have been very proud. Uh, involved, uh, whoever was involved with the Irish team that day, it was uh, it was great to win the group. It was great to beat France. Uh, unfortunately, the the attritional nature of that game uh, left uh, us a bit thin on the ground going into the the next match against Argentina. You know, whenever you lose your your playmakers like uh, Sexton, who who fell earlier in the in the tournament and wasn't able to play against mm -hmm. the Argentinians, Jared Payne was out. Paul Connell obviously was the loss, Peter O'Mahony, these are big leaders on the pitch and great players as well so whenever you take that uh, far part out of the, out of the, uh, the team then uh, Ireland are always going to struggle a wee bit. Very disappointing the fact that England went out you know as the host nation but uh, you have to give it? praise, well, <laughs> no, but you have to give praise to the English fans, I, I thought they were superb, England out yeah. and yet they were still there. The, the the venues were sellouts. Uh -huh. I thought it was a massive a massive statement uh, by the English fans. It was yeah, and it was great to see uh, great hosts. Uh, you know, uh, small communities came out and they supported the the matches. They supported those second tier nations that uh, that usually wouldn't get the the biggest of crowds and, and the stadiums were packed full. So uh, again, I think the weather helped. It, it brought those casual fans out and and uh, they put out. A good product on show as well, which always helps. So, uh, no great hosts and, and a great tournament, probably one of the best in memory. How do you think Joe Schmidt, in a quieter moment, will reflect on that? He'll be disappointed, but unfortunately, the injuries. You know, it is a, a it's a very tough sport now. It really is. It's it's uh, it's you know bigger, stronger, faster than uh, even when I played two or three years ago, and. Uh, and that attritional nature, you're always going to find find injuries. And Ireland have a smaller playing pool than most of these top tier uh, nations. So whenever you take away a few of their top their frontline players, they're always going to struggle a wee bit. But uh, I think there were small margins. They still could have beaten Argentina. I have no doubt about that. I think if uh, if this, if the referee had given a second yellow card to the Argentinian proper era, I think. Uh, I think Ireland would have won the match and uh, they did so well to claw their way back into the game and they just ran out of steam unfortunately. Harry, is it a case that Joe Smith will um, will lose a lot of the more experienced players now as he looks to the future? You know the Six Nations mm -hmm. just around the corner, will a lot of players, will they, will they quit themselves or will they be sort of told that's it, your service is very good but we're going to move on here? Well I think uh, I don't think Ireland can afford to do that. I, I don't think they can take that approach where they just say we're looking four years down the line now. Mm -hmm. We're going to you know, move those more experienced players that may not be around for the next World Cup aside to blood new players because I don't think we have the depth to do that. I think uh, their experience will help those younger players come through and maybe two years, three years down the line if, if those younger developing players are good enough then they may fill the boots of those those older players. Uh, I think Joe will look at the strategy he adopts now uh, and he'll have to evolve that slightly now. Uh, it is a pragmatic approach but I think we 
found at times an inability to create scoring chances and uh, I think you'll look at that. Uh, uh, the kick to retain possession strategy that he adopts all the time, I think mm -hmm. uh, teams were aware of that and uh, they countered against that as well. And, and Argentina found fault in, in, in Ireland's defence uh, at times in that, in that game. They, they adopted a wide-to-wide -wide policy of, of playing the ball uh, into those wide channels and they, they were able to uh, develop really good attacking strategies off that. So those are little things that Joe will look at from, uh, from the World Cup and try to, to put right for the Six Nations. Which credence do you give to the theory that um, the Six Nations, remember at the time after, you know, in Ireland, they were beaten at the Six Nations, basically it's only a second division competition now, when you look at the success of, uh, you know, the uh, the Southern Hemisphere sides? Yeah, I mean, I mean, I guess the proof's in the pudding, you know, you had four semi-finalists and they were all the, the, the Sanzar, the Southern Hemisphere teams, and uh, unfortunately, you know, Scotland, you know, bar a bad refereeing decision would have been there. Uh, Ireland, I think, if they didn't have as many injuries would have been there. Uh, and, and Wales were very unlucky as well. So, you know, there were there were a number of close calls. So I wouldn't think it was all doom and gloom for the Northern Hemisphere, but certainly the Southern Hemisphere showed their class in the tournament. And on home soil, England will be very disappointed that uh, they underperformed as well. Now, of course, they have a new coach as well. They look to the Six Nations and we're away in the Six Nations too that you know always perceived yes. as the two real difficult teams, you know, France and England. We always look at that with trepidation, you uh -huh. know. And do you think Ireland can retain their title? I think they can. I think Ireland have huge confidence uh, in all the nations they play in the Six Nations. They have a, a really good record under Joe Smith. So there's no reason why Ireland can't retain their uh, their dominance of the competition. I mean, it's going to be very difficult. Uh, uh, the provinces aren't showing great form either at the moment, which is a bit of a concern, and, and certainly in Europe. Uh, so I think the, the the fallout from the World Cup has hit the provinces hard, and uh, they have a couple of months now to, to prepare for the Six Nations, uh, get their bodies fit again. Uh, it's going to be difficult. There's a number of Heineken or European Cup games to play still, so uh, that will be difficult. So uh, you know it's going to be a tough task. But if Ireland are able to put to put out on the pitch a strong a strong enough fifteen, they they have every confidence in beating those home nations. Paddy, is it a concern when you you know, you mention the provinces? Is it a concern the fact that the provinces look to be struggling in Europe at this stage? It's a bit of a worry. Uh, you know the the World Cup would have taken a lot out of those frontline players that the provinces rely on week in week out. They're their stars, and they've had an attritional World Cup, and they're coming back into really competitive rugby in the European Cup. So, uh, and because the provinces there's there's three main teams, and and Connor obviously uh, viewed more as maybe a developing side. Uh, there's a lot of uh, emphasis put on those frontline players, uh, whereas in England. Uh, they have a bigger playing base and they can probably be a bit more competitive. Uh, so I think it'll take a few weeks for, for those players coming back from the World Cup to mm -hmm. uh, you know, to climatise back into provincial rugby and get the best out of them. But uh, hopefully it's not, not too late for, for Ulster to make a run the European Cup. Uh, you know, it doesn't look great at the moment. Uh, certainly they would have hoped for a better uh, result at home against Saracens, uh, they'll be disappointed from that, but uh, you know they can still go away to France and win that, that uh, rearranged fixture as well and put themselves back in the running. Paddy, I was at that game and I was disappointed in I think every every aspect of the game. I thought that uh, Ulster uh, never looked as if they were going to win it. I thought they, for the first time I've been at uh, Kingspan Ravenhill, uh, there was a lack of atmosphere, whether uh -huh. it was the weather, I don't know. There just wasn't something right about that fixture. Yeah. Ulster, uh, Ulster and Lace kiss and, the, and you know and Neil and the lads would need to sort that out. Yeah, I mean it, it looked flat, didn't it? And mm -hmm. uh, you know that's not something you expect on a European Friday night at uh, at, at Kingspan. So that'll be a concern. Uh, you know, it's you know, does the team need to produce a performance for the crowd to get into it and provide that atmosphere? Or, you know, is the f are the fans are they? Should they be there to provide an atmosphere that the, the players can thrive under? It's sort of a chicken and an egg thing. So, uh, 
I, I know Les will be very disappointed uh, in charge now for the second game and having such a disappointing result. So there's still a lot to play for. Uh, and as I say, those guys coming back in, uh, you know, guys coming back from injury will make a big difference for Ulster. So uh, hopefully Gigi and the boys and the medical team will, will be working their magic and getting as many players back on the pitch as possible. Very harsh game when you look at it, you know, the hits, you know, the mini car crashes are incredible whenever you watch the game and I suppose maybe we're expecting too much, but hopefully Ulster can identify that and identify the fact that I listened to a few fans and they complained about atmosphere. It's exactly what you say. Uh, are the players meant to lift the fans or the fans meant to lift the players? Yeah. I think somebody needs to look at that and get back to the atmosphere that we had. Now, it's only one game, I understand that, but we need to get back to the atmosphere it used to be. It was it was it was rocking like it was it bouncing was, yeah. whenever you were up there, and it wasn't happening against Saracens, which was a bit of a shame. I thought. Uh -huh. I mean, they were always my favourite nights to play, and the European games drag something out of the players uh, that that the Pro Twelve or the Magners or the Rabo or whatever it was back in the day didn't. And uh, from that point of view, it'll be it'll be massively disappointed, disappointing for both the players, management, and fans alike that uh, it was such a flat performance on Friday. Uh, they won't want to let that happen again because, uh, you know, you could lose then the, the casual supporter that fills that eighteen thousand uh, seater mm -hmm. stadium, uh, and that may be part of the the problem with the, the atmosphere is you you are bringing in a casual fan that that traditionally wouldn't have supported Ulster, and uh, you do as a player need to provide them with something to get it, get their teeth into mm -hmm. and. Uh, you know that will be concerning, but you know I have every faith in Les Kiss. I think he's the right man uh, for the job, and I think he'll get the best out of the players. And it's difficult in a in a in a cycle of contracts, uh, in a World Cup cycle. Uh, you know Les will want to put his stamp on the recruitment going forward now, and the players they bring in. You know David Humphreys leaving suddenly like that would have caused a bit of a problem with the recruitment uh, mm -hmm. strategy that he he was providing Ulster. He was doing very well recruiting players, recruiting some of the best players. And I don't think since his departure uh, they've been able to fill the gaps, like the, the loss of Johan Miller and, and Stephen Ferris and, mm -hmm. and the Paddy Wallaces. And hmm. now, there's plenty of centres now, I'll tell you <laughs> that. But, uh, you know, once Les gets his... his uh, foot in the door and uh, working alongside Brent Cunningham who, who's doing a great job uh, you know the pay toys coming next year they'll hopefully uh, pinpoint another couple of positions they can strengthen uh, and then Les will have the team that, that he'll feel comfortable working with Good, so it's not all doom and gloom for no, our No, I don't think so. No, no, no. Okay. But look, before you go, I want to talk to you as well, too. You're very busy. You're yes. in here for very lucky to get you a series <laughs> of meetings because you have your big banquet coming up in yes. uh, December uh -huh. uh, for autism, your fund. Do you want to tell us about that? Yeah, I've, I've just recently set up a, a fund for autism, uh, sort of off the back of my testimonial last year where we were able to, to raise uh, you know, a large amount of money. Uh, off the back of that, now we're funding a a service program through autism initiatives to provide uh, you know a member of staff for the next two years and provide all their services uh, through our project oaks uh, uh, service provider so it's it's been great it's it's something close to my heart through our son paddy jack uh, and uh, you know he's he's thriving now uh, through early diagnosis early intervention he is living as normal a life as we could have hoped for and uh, it's an opportunity to, to maybe give something back. So Tina, my wife and I are, are, are you know, passionate about it. We're having a big fundraiser on the 10th of, uh, 10th of December at the Titanic. Uh, we've got Jimmy Nesbitt coming back to MC. Logie will be there. <laughs> uh, so sneaking in. Sneaking in there, yeah. We've got uh, our great golfer, uh, Rory McIlroy, will be in the, in the audience supporting it again, which is fantastic. So try to celebrate as much of, of Northern Ireland's talent as possible and that's why you're there Logie. Good man. <laughs> I'm looking forward to hope it's a big success. I'm sure it will be. All the very best. Thank you very much.